This is the car cast where we demystify, simplify Gen AI for all of you. Dare I say, this is the ultimate guide to Gen AI. Maybe uh, I'll let you be the judge of that. But today we're going to tackle some of the most important questions you're asking yourself and maybe your CEO is asking you about Gen AI. What are the worst and best practices for scaling enterprise AI? How do you pick the best Gen AI use cases to pursue beyond the typical value cost and capability matrix that people use? And then finally, what do you not know about Gen AI that you should? If we have extra time, we're also going to tackle some of the questions you've sent to us, like how should I evaluate options across the Gen AI stack, models, applications, agent builders? What is Gen AI's killer app? So you're going to want to stick until the end of this car cast to get answers to those questions, plus some additional resources. Now, you notice I've been saying we all the time. And if you're one of the 6 million people who follow this car cast everywhere it's syndicated, you know that today I have a very, very special guest that's joining me to answer all these questions. But before I reveal the guest, if you're not familiar with this car cast, you're not following it yet, take a second. Hit the subscribe button because it's going to let you into our great community and because it also let you know as soon as a new video is available for you to watch and share. All right, let's talk about our guest. He is a former Gartner vice president. He is a top 10 speaker of industry conference. In fact, this week, he was here in Silicon Valley keynoting an industry event. He's a very prolific writer in the topic of data observability, data products. You can catch him on his podcast called It Depends, where he invites brilliant guests to share their discoveries in the world of data, AI, and analytics. And this coming week, he's going to be at the Gartner Data and Analytics Summit in London. So you're gonna be able to see him there. If you have not guessed this just yet, my guest is no other than Sanjeev Mohan, also known as Sanjmo. Sanjeev, welcome to the CarCast. Bruno, thank you so much for such an amazing, kind introduction. I am honored to be on your show. Of course. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. And I notice even on your desk, you've got those brilliant sunglasses. So you're going to be on brand today for a car cast. Let's get going with the first question. You spend a lot of time with customers. You've seen incredible success. You've seen struggles as well. What are the worst and best practices in use right now uh, when it comes to enterprise AI? Great, great question. By the way, I got my glasses especially for you. So, <laughs> so we, we look like twins here. I think the worst practice, in my opinion, is people who are telling me, Jenny is not ready. I'm just going to wait and see. I think there can be nothing more horrible than, than people uh, sitting on the sidelines waiting for this technology to improve. I strongly believe that we should just get in get our hands dirty, keep the cost uh, in mind. But also the worst practice is to start, treat it as a technology project. Gen AI is a business initiative, not a technology project. Now, obviously you need technology to be successful. So, so start with, with your business counterparts. So the, the best practice is pick the right use case that is strategic to an organization. For example, an organization may say that you are going through some economic headwinds. We want to save cost and we want to improve productivity. Great. So that's a starting point for the conversation. But productivity of what? So somebody says, well, I volunteered. Let's see developer productivity. Okay, perfect. So now comes the next question. What do we mean by developer productivity? So somebody says, you know, we've heard that large language models can be used to generate code. So let's see if we can we can reduce our, our cost by leveraging LLM to, to write code for us. So that's good, but what code do you want to write? So one uh, user may say, I want natural language to do SQL generation. Another may say, you know, I've got Python code. Another team may say, well, guess what? I know that there are these models that can do COBOL to Java. So maybe that uh, mainframe modernization project that we, we we failed to implement, maybe maybe now there's a life, and if we can migrate 60 to 80% of our mainframe COBOL code 
into something new, we can modernize a mainframe or migrate off a mainframe. You see, so all these options open up, but nothing happens unless you have the business with some strategic use case initiating this process. And it's a great opportunity when it comes to Gen AI to engage the business. You know, my observation has been that typically the folks that win, they have a principled approach, right? They, mm -hmm. they think about the performance and the cost equation that you just mentioned. That's really important to understand what your trade-offs are. They think about security, right? So they figure out, okay, what are the guardrails that I could effectively enforce? What models can I govern? What agent uh, creation and output can I really understand? They think about transparency and the origination and also the audit of the output. How do I manage citation and how do I audit the output that's that's being created? And then finally, the integration. I think we talked a little bit about this uh, offline earlier where integration across infrastructure, the models and the applications matter. One thing I know we're going to talk about is this idea of grounding and data. You know, what I've learned is that you need to have a two model strategy, a strategy for small models and a strategy for large models because the use cases tend to differ when you have around internal data, data that's originated from your application where precision is really important, small models and precision on those models are really important. Whereas generic questions around industry best practices coding, like what you just talked about as an example, where you're trying to learn from the community best practice around coding might be acceptable for large models. So there is a little bit of a principle for your organization as well as the right size model for the right size use case. Now, when we're talking about use cases, you've also seen a lot of how organizations think about organizing their use cases. How should you pick the best Gen AI use case to pursue beyond just this idea of value or strategic importance or capability? We have already seen that uh, Gen AI has now demonstrated success in certain areas like customer success. So oh, that we can now put chatbots and we can automate a lot of Q&A and reduce. In fact, there are some very famous use cases like Klarna, save uh, $40 million. Their chatbot saved the amount of work which would have required 700 people. Which is which is massive. You know, we don't uh, have that kind of capability to hire an army of, of people. So we uh, we have to be very careful about not only does a use case need to be strategic, but what is going to be the value, the cost, and the complexity. Yeah. So what I propose to to my clients is uh, is to have a sort of a hackathon, or the a business and IT team should work together. They should say, you know, these are our pain points. These are areas where we can we can leverage AI to become more efficient. Prioritize those based on, on cost, value, complexity. Then go into the model. So you mentioned strategy for small language, large language models. That is exactly what we then need to do. We need to figure out what is the right model. One extremely important point is, is that in data, we made a mistake. So Bruno, remember, like you were an early part of this big data journey where we started off with a technology project and we neglected data governance. What I'm saying is that AI, we've learned our lessons. So the two important lessons that I have learned is one, your governance cannot be an afterthought. As you are going through this whole journey of trying to identify for your industry, your organization, which are the right use cases, document them. And they're already, AI governance is a good topic, but there are some, some really good tools out there that will let you go through this whole process of selecting the use case, selecting the model, experimentation, understanding what value you got, iterating on that. You want all that documented. So that's one, one lesson I've learned. The second lesson that I, I've also learned pretty late in my data journey was the importance of product management. You know how much I've talked about uh, data as a product or data product. Yeah. I think the same thing needs to apply to our Gen AI project. And this documentation becomes really important because there's some accountability, there's an ownership, and, and you are basically going through this sort of a versioning of your experimentation. And so, you know, this idea of... Uh being focused on LLM, it could be actually detrimental is, is what yeah. I learned. It's, it's almost this idea of like, you know, the approach of LLM is the answer. What's the question never really works. Yeah. Some, some of the customers I've observed, they, one customer in particular, uh, 
told me, he said, you know, Jenny I is about multi. And I said, what, what do you mean multi? He said, well, when I think about it as that it's multimodal as a principle, uh, we know that's going to be the norm, right? And second, it's multimodal. What I mean by that is multiple models. Yeah. It's really going to be one model that's going to be the answer to everything and being able to do side-to-side -side comparisons is important. Third, it's multi-cloud. So you have to realize your data is across multiple clouds, so you need openness. Then it's multi-step. We talk a lot about context, and people, I think, have a hard time understanding why is context so important is because it's not just the size of the of the context itself, but it's how much the context can help you drive precision. And here we talk in terms of tokens, but often we need to translate these tokens into what they actually mean. So for instance, 1.5 million tokens, what is that? Well, it's estimated to be about 700,000 words. Well, the average book is anywhere between 50 to 80,000. So 1.5 million tokens, that's eight books. And that means a lot. It being able to ingest eight books, it's incredible context. And then finally, and you said this earlier, multi-year, right? This is not something that's just going to happen this year and then you'll be done with it. Just like it was with big data, you're going to have to live with the evolution of that across multiple years. All right. Mm -hmm. Now there's the flip side of that, which is when not to use Gen AI. There's a lot of research in the market showing that only 4% of your data is in fact Gen AI ready. So how do I think about that one? So that, that's quite easy. By the way, I, I love the way you said, you know, multi-model, multi-step, multi-year, multi-cloud. Each of those could be a chapter in, in your next book if you were to write. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. So to answer your question, you know, when should you not use Gen AI? Uh, people who are skeptical about Gen AI and who are even watching this video are probably shaking their heads and they're saying, I think you guys are, are going too far ahead in Gen AI because my data is not even ready. So that's the first step. When should you not use Gen AI is when you don't even know what data you have. You don't have a good handle over what sources of data you have. How many copies of data do you have? Which is, which is the single source of truth? And you're off on this Gen AI journey. So I think the step number one is to get your data house in order. Without that, there is no Gen AI. The second uh, topic is, so if we were to say, okay, so let's take let's take a leap of faith and forget data for a second and just talk about Gen AI. Your second place where you should not use Gen AI is when you must absolutely have, uh, have uh, bulletproof reliability and accuracy. Because Gen AI is probabilistic. So you cannot expect, Gen AI actually, the beautiful part of Gen AI is that I can ask Gen AI questions that I can never ask uh, through a SQL. Because to your point, like you said earlier, because it understands the context and has been trained on so much data, I can add it, I can ask it to create me a plan or tell me why my sales are, are erratic when these conditions happen. I can ask these questions in, in English or French or whatever language I want. And it'll translate it. By the way, the same language model will translate all these languages, which is the other beautiful part. But the, the thing is that there's no SQL uh, for this because you're asking a very archaic a question that's very contextual rather than very deterministic. A lot of people listening here probably think there's an insane amount of knowledge they got to get in order to understand Gen AI. So maybe let's help them here. You know, tell mm -hmm. me something about Gen AI that 99% of people don't know. Maybe a better way to ask is, what do people not know about Gen AI that they really should? The reason why we are struggling to some extent with Gen AI is because there's so much emphasis on prompt engineering. I was just reading yesterday a very interesting article about Anthropic has created something called a prompt generator for its LLM of Claude models. I think this is something that we should never have to manipulate our prompts to manipulate the LLMs. The other thing is, let's even take a step back. What is AI? AI is nothing but a process of trying to automate a, the human brain. But how does the human brain work? We, like you and I are talking to each other and we are learning new stuff. So we are training our brain. And then you ask me questions and I answer. So I'm doing some reasoning and I'm generating the response. 
So there's training, there's reasoning, and then there is the generation of, of responses. In AI, uh, we have trained the models, with vast amounts of data, and now we're asking it questions. But what is missing in between is that reasoning part that the human brain has, which the AI, current AI state is missing the reasoning, the reflection, the self-learning that the human brain does. Where I'm going to this is that I feel that next year, this time, we would have this concept of agents and assistants that are not just taking my question and giving me a response from a model that, that's frozen in time because we're not constantly training these models. It's very expensive to train them. But the, the models are learning, self-reflection, self-learning, uh, continuously tuning uh, or training themselves and tuning and then being giving us answers that, that are far more aware of my situation and my context than what we have today. Now, speaking about killer apps, you have mm -hmm. a perspective on that as well. What is Gen AI's killer app? How do I think about that? The question about killer app, this has come up before in my conversations. And, and the question I, I ask is, what is a killer app, a World Wide Web, or, the, or as we call it, the internet? For some people, it may be email. For some, it's social media. For some, it may be DoorDash. What is a, there is no killer app uh, per se for the internet. But the interesting thing is that internet has made our processes spectacularly efficient. I can do yeah. all my taxes. I can do all my grocery shopping on the internet. I feel that the Gen AI is going to be exactly that, except with this contextual intelligence agentic behavior. So the killer use case of Gen AI would be making us a, a lot more productive, improving the processes, like booking an airline, hotel, reading my email, ordering stuff online. So each of these different companies will have their own LLMs and we'll have a mesh or a network just like a human, the human brain has neural network that is going to make our lives a lot easier through this. So it's a better process, basically, of how we lead our lives. Yeah, the execution of multi-step tasks. So Correct. ultimately, you don't yeah. ask it one question. It's a multi-step process by which there's integration and the creation of an agent that would essentially create value for you across multiple tasks, maybe even invent tasks for themselves. So they yeah. can complete the, the job they're trying to solve for you. You have a perspective as well for what's happening next year. And everyone's on the edge of their seats um, because it's going so fast already. It's difficult to imagine yeah. what's going to happen next. What's your perspective on that? I think there are a lot of exciting things that are coming up. We live in a world with rampant, frantic new development. I've never seen this, by the way. In over 30 years of my career, I have never seen this level the space of development. There is a arms race going on uh, across both the LLMs and the hardware or the GPU chips. In LLMs, we know Meta has already announced that they are going to have their AMA tree with 405 billion parameters model coming out in June. Uh, also, GPT OpenAI is overdue now. Any day they may announce the next version of GPT, which will be probably GPT-5. Uh, I actually, Bruno had a very interesting thought. Uh, this is something we, we've never talked about. I was just thinking that some 25 years ago, Intel was in this uh, space of coming out with these new chips. Do you remember when we used to use 80286? Yeah. Uh, then 386 came out, then 486 yeah. came out, and then we were sitting on the edge of our seats waiting for 586. It never happened because Pentium came out. We were so disappointed. Yeah. What, what do you mean Pentium? We were expecting 586. So maybe GPT-5 will be GPT Pentium or something like that. So That's a clever analogy. So so I, I was just thinking, wow, we are reliving those days 25 years later, except it's no longer CPU. It's either a GPU or an LLM. One more thing that's happening in June uh, is Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference is going to happen. So we are expecting there to be a brand new version of Siri, which will be a, more like chat GPT. Later in the year, Apple is gonna come out with iPhone 16. Most likely it'll come out with, uh, it will have a GPU. It will have some sort of a language model on it. 
So, so these are some interesting things that are coming out. New hardware devices are coming out and then agents uh, will become more pervasive. That's a lot to uh, look forward to just for the, the summer. Uh, like I said, Sanjeev, I know uh, we could talk here forever. Uh, where could people find you? The best way is to follow me on LinkedIn. I would be very grateful if people follow me, subscribe me on my It Depends podcast. Thank you for mentioning that. And my Medium blog. It's very easy. You just have to search for my company name, Sanjmo. It Depends or Sanjmo at medium.com. And I'm going to put the link to all of that down here, both uh, as a banner as well as in the comments. Sanjeev, thank you so much for spending the time with us uh, today. And of course, if people want to catch you, they can find you in London next week. And with that, we will see you next week. Thank you.